Oprah Winfrey said this about her mentor, celebrated author and poet, the late Maya Angelou. She was there for me always, guiding me through some of the most important years of my life. Physicist and astronaut Sally Ride said this of her lifelong mentor. They instilled confidence and made me believe that I could accomplish what I set out to accomplish. Emmy-nominated actress Victoria Rowe, who spent 18 years in foster care, said this of her foster mother, Agatha Armstead. Without her mentoring, without her guidance, without her courage, I could never have experienced such a rich opportunity. These are just a few examples of women's lives who are changed by older women, believing in them and investing in them. In Scripture, we can see this example in the, the life of Naomi and Ruth. And we can also see throughout um, even our own church examples of women who invested in younger women and whose lives were changed. And of course, how I like to view things many times is through uh, examples in movies. So these examples in movies are part of a movie script, but a great example of an older woman mentoring those younger. So as I like to do, audience participation, let's see how well your movie mentoring relationship knowledge is. First of all, who was the umbrella flying nanny who not only mentored the bank's children, but actually the entire family. Mary Poppins. Yes, great mentoring example. Another mentoring example. What's the name of another mentoring nanny whose looks changed when the hearts of the children changed? Nanny McPhee. All right. A TV mom that was a great example of the mother-daughter mentoring relationship was found in the beloved TV series that took place on a prairie. Name? Little House on the Prairie. Who was, who was the mom? Carolyn. Carolyn Ingalls. Yes. Now this next one from one of my favorite movie series, A Princess can even be a mentor to a rebellion and a young female Jedi. What is the older mentor's name? Leia. Leia. Thank you very much, Princess Leia. Now, this is a bonus, bonus question for a candy bar. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. For a candy bar. This bonus question will get this person a candy bar. Who can tell me? The sun-raising pony, who is a mentor to Twilight Sparkle. <laughs> Princess Celestia, Mark, catch it and pass it back. Right behind you. Good job, Princess Celestia. Yes. Right. Awesome. Mark, you knew that, but you wanted her to get the candy bar. I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. So (laughs) whether through movies, history, even the history of our faith, we can easily see the value of older women, or in that situation, ponies, that invest in younger women. It should not surprise us that this is God's design. This is God's design. God is a generational God, that God works within all generations, but he calls us to be a church that is not only a value, but has a purpose to each other. So last week, we talked about older men and God's purpose and plan for older men to mentor and raise up younger men. Well, today we are talking about God's purpose and design for older women to bridge the gap and pursue and invest and raise up and encourage and train younger women. And it is the responsibility of the older generation to pursue that, to see that calling. Now, on the other side, it's the responsibility of you younger women and you teen girls and young girls to be able to see the value of older women speaking into your life. 
Older women coming alongside and encouraging you and helping you in issues of relationships and responsibilities and character and above all, faith. God's plan is not for division of generations, but for unity, for unity. And that's what we are going to look at today. Again, last week it was Titus chapter 2, the Apostle Paul's instructions to older men in regards of younger men, and today it's again Titus chapter 2, and we find the Apostle Paul now giving instructions to older women to mentor and invest in the lives of younger women. Now, if you are not a woman or a young lady today, you can still pay attention. This is not time to clock out, right? This is time for you to be praying because this is so important for the church. And if you are a younger woman, this is for you to be able to see what God wants you to grow towards, but also God's design for your life. And for older women, it is all about the character that God wants to produce in his people so the older generation is a value of investment and mentoring in the younger generation. Now, the question that I always get is, well, what's the age line? You know, they want to know, well, what's an older woman? Now, I've learned in my life, you've got to be careful. You don't ever say to a woman, oh, you're an older woman. No, you don't do that, right? So what I'm going to say is that when I say older woman, this represents a season of life. And it represents a season of life, not when the woman is, is at the age or the season that she is raising her children, okay? This is the season of life that would be parallel to a woman who does no longer has children at home, okay? She's no longer raising up children or nieces or nephews or anything like that. This is all about the season of life when they are now adults. So you do, you do the connection point here and call yourself older based upon that. I had nothing to do with it. All right, so we are going to look at Paul's instructions, and this is so important. This is not only a timely message that was given to the women at this time over 2,000 years ago, but it is a timely message today, timely message today. Let's go ahead and look at Paul's instructions, Titus chapter 2, verses 3 through 4. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in their behavior, not malicious gossips, nor enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good so that they may encourage the young women. Now, let me give you a little bit of a historical context here. Now, what is going on in this time is this is, let me give you a picture of the church in this time, a picture of the older women. The older women were so valuable in this time Not only were they instructed, as Paul outlines here, to train up, raise up, invest, mentor younger women, but they were so important when it came to visiting those who were sick. They were so valuable visiting the Christians, fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, visiting them when they were sick, when they were sick. Not only that, they were so valuable visiting those in prison. This is all a part of what was going on during this time. There's something else, though, that culturally and historically, when I was doing the research, just blew me away. You see, during this time in the Roman culture, pagan Roman culture, what what pagan parents would do is when they did not want a child, which you can't even imagine that, right? They, They would not want their child, and so they would abandon their child in the streets, go outside the city and abandon a newborn. And so what these older women in the church would do is they took it upon themselves to go and really be be an ambassador for these kids. And so they went and they would find these newborns abandoned and they would take them and they would bring them to the church for a Christian family to adopt. So when, when you read what Paul's saying, Paul is saying, older women, you are 
So valuable to the church. You are a priceless gift of God, not only to Christians, but to non-Christians. So please, may your character be in such a way so that God moves in such a powerful way in your life. And honestly, I can look at the church today and see the same thing. There is such a calling upon older women today. I mean, you can look in your life. I mean, I can, I can look out and I can see the impact that older women have had because they are faithful. They're faithful to the gospel of Jesus Christ and they're faithful to loving the church. So we should not be surprised that Paul here is, is saying, hey, this is how not only this generation of older women are, are so effective in the kingdom work, but this is how this continues to every generation, to every generation. And 2,000 years later, we see the ministry and impact. But Paul gives us some clear qualities and character traits that position these women to be valuable and effective. So let's, let's go ahead and look at those. We're going to look at four things that Paul outlines. And the very first one is uh, really the most important because it sets the foundation for the next. If you have your bulletin, you can follow along. Number one, the first quality that God desires in older women is this. Older women are to be reverent in their behavior. Older women are to be reverent in their behavior. Now, when Paul wrote this, this in the Greek language, it wasn't four words. It wasn't reverent in their behavior. It was actually one Greek word. And I'm not going to try to say it because I would totally mess it up. But this one Greek word, this is the only place in the New Testament that you find this word. And that, to me, whenever that happens, to me, Paul carefully, carefully chose this word. Ultimately, the Holy Spirit led Paul to use this word. And I want you to understand really just the power that's being revealed here. So first quality of an older woman is to be reverent in their behavior. That word means priest-like. Priest-like. What in the world does that mean? Let me explain. When he says older women are to be reverent in their behavior, it means that older women are to have matured towards holiness. They have to mature towards those who are in the likeness of Christ and those who pursue and stay in the connection and in the presence of God. Because a priest was one who was called by God to not only to be in God's presence, but to be in service to God. And if Paul is saying that older women are to be like priests, means that older women are to live their lives in such a way that their hearts, their minds, their attitudes, their choices, the things that they do consistently keep them connected with God. They are constantly, constantly connected with Jesus Christ, that they are not moved by, oh, this fell apart, my oven broke, and now all, I'm just focusing on all the wrong things. Oh, this happened, and this is bad, and this... No, they constantly are steady in the presence of God. That's a picture of what older women are to mature to, younger women. That's what God wants to do in your life. Let me give you an example in Scripture an example of this spiritual maturity is described for us in Luke chapter 2, verse 37. This is when Mary and Joseph, they have baby Jesus, and according to the law, they have to take Jesus to the temple in Jerusalem. And so they do that, and when they're there at the temple, there is a woman who is a widow at the age of 84. Her name is Anna. And in verse 37, it reveals that she was a woman of constant pursuit of God. She was priest-like in how she lived her life. And this is what it says. She never left the temple, serving night and day with fastings and prayers. Now, what we see here is, is an outward actions of holiness that come from an inward condition of holiness. 
She is outwardly seeking God in the temple night and day, praying and fasting. That comes from her heart that is set on God at all times. You see what God is calling women to? I mean, don't you think that has great purpose within the church? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's not that, it's not that you're, just, you're just a Christian woman on Sunday for one hour. No, every day you are seeking God. Every day on behalf of your family, on behalf, I'll tell you, somebody that always comes to mind with this is Evelyn Ellis. If you didn't know Evelyn Ellis, boy, you missed something. Because she was constantly, constantly in prayer. That passage of scripture, you know, pray without ceasing in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. I mean, every time I would go and see her, I mean, she, she, had, she had her Bible open and she had her prayer list that was constantly moving right in the presence of God. That is the picture of what God is calling women to be. It is that picture of reverent in behavior. It is outward actions of holiness that come from an inward condition of holiness. And that is very much why that is appropriate, like a priest, like a priest, in the presence of God and in the service of God And it never stops. That's the first thing. The second, the second, the only way that they can achieve the second is through making sure the first is is, uh, secured in their life. Paul goes on to say, older women are not to be malicious gossipers. Malicious gossipers. I don't have to tell you this. You all know this. Men at their worst, you can see this through history, men at their worst tend to be violent in their actions. Women, at their worst, have a tendency to be violent in their words. Have a tendency to be violent in their words. Paul uses the Greek word diabolos. Diabolos describes this sinful behavior. And I don't want you to take this malicious gossipers and just cruise on by and go, oh, not a big deal. Yeah, t- yeah, I talk about somebody. Yeah, I say negative things. Yeah, I spread a little bit of gossip. No, this is a very serious, sinful condition. It's not a light accusation. Let me explain why. This word diabolos actually appears as a name for Satan. Now, no one walk out of here and says, Daryl called older women Satan. No, I didn't. This is just scripture here. This is the apostle Paul saying, when you are malicious gossipers, you are in the likeness, not of a priest, but you are in the likeness of Satan. Because all Satan does is slanders. All he does is speaks lies. All Satan does night and day, night and day is causes harm. And see, this word means slanderous, deceitful. And I I love this. It actually means those who whisper harm to others. And Paul is saying, older women, guard your hearts. Always be in the presence and service of God so that what comes out of your mouth is only edifying to the body of believers, is only encouraging, and is only giving praise to God. Because if you step into this likeness of our enemy, not only will he have control of what comes out of your mouth, but he will continually lead you away from the presence of God. You see how important this is? Paul is saying that this is the work of Satan and older women should not engage in this at all. They should be like priests and not like the devil. The third quality that God desires, again, comes from that first thing, being priest-like. It involves when you stay away from malicious gossip. But this third one is that older women are not to be enslaved to wine. Now, don't limit this to just alcohol, okay? There's definitely 
there's definitely some application to that, but don't limit it to just that because there's a deeper meaning here. And we find that deeper meaning by looking at what the Apostle Paul says to all Christians in Ephesians 5.18. It says, Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. And so we don't use debauchery very often. I'm sure your kids don't come home from school and say, hey, debauchery, debauchery. No, we don't use that. So let me explain what it means. Debauchery means extreme indulgence that results in a loss of control. That could be anything. That's anything that you allow to have control in your life. Alcohol is an easy example because every single person, if they consume too much alcohol, they will be out of control. But the picture here, again, is anything. Could be eating. Could be Facebook. Could be TV. It could be talking about people. It could be thinking about things that are, that are taking you away from what God would have you to focus. It could be anything that controls your life. And Paul is saying older women are to not be controlled by things that would take them away from God, but they need to allow the Holy Spirit to be leading their life. Because he says here, he says, do not be drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. God wants to fill our lives with his very presence, with the very ministry, with the discernment and wisdom, with the character that not only leads us towards Christ, but leads others towards Christ. And that's why it says be filled with the Spirit. Filled with the Holy Spirit. That's the third thing. Be filled by God. May each area of your life be in step with how the Spirit is leading. So let me summarize what we've seen so far. Let me summarize. God is calling older women to outward actions of holiness that come from an inward condition of holiness. This is manifested in the holiness of speech and in spirit-filled self-control. This leads to the last point, the last point of what Paul says to Titus. Older women likewise are to be reverent in their behavior, not malicious gossips, nor enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good so that they may encourage the young women. See, when older women continually seek God, and not only do the things that come out of their mouth are glorifying God, but they allow the Spirit to lead and guide and control their life, then they will be valuable in raising up the next generation. You see how it all works together. It's not just about me. It's not just about, yeah, live a holy life just for you. No, it's so then you can raise up the next generation, and that's the fourth part. The fourth thing Paul's instructing, older women are to teach and encourage younger women. And again, the reason why we know that this is for the season of life, that you're no longer raising your own kids, is because it answers the question, who are they to be teaching in verse 4? They are to be teaching the younger women in the church. They are to be teaching. The, so it's not, oh, I have my own kids, now I'm a grandma, now I get to sit back and do nothing. No, you are still investing in your family, but now you can invest in those who are younger, those younger Christian women. And it is so important because I'll be honest with you, I've talked to a lot of young Christian moms, Christian wives, young teen girls, and they feel overwhelmed, they feel discouraged, they feel like failures. Their life is a constant struggle, and they need older women to come alongside and say, I've been there. Here is the hope of Jesus Christ. You are not alone. I believe in you because I believe in the power of God in you, and I'm not leaving you. I'm going to walk with you through this. But what happens is, is the devil has come in the church, and he has said, older women, the younger women don't need you. 
Older women, they don't care what you have to say. They're too busy. They think they know it all. And then they, the younger women feel like, I, I don't want to be a burden. I don't want to talk. I don't want to share this with them because I don't want them to look down upon me. And then there becomes this gap. It's called division. It calls quenching the Holy Spirit that wants to unite sisters in Christ so that there is a life-giving relationship in which you come alongside and say, I've been there. I don't have it all figured out and I messed up a lot. But these are the lessons learned. Here's the grace received. I love you. Let me be there for you. That's the picture here. That's what Paul is calling to. But again, we've got to kick the enemy out. And we've got to tell the enemy, you're a liar, because the truth is, older women, the younger women need you. Period. Younger women, you need the older women. Period. This is God's design, and Paul is making it so clear here. And I want to point something out. I don't know if you've realized this, but Christian women and Christian teens and young girls are under attack from the enemy. They're under attack. They are told by culture what their identity and value and worth is, and it's a lie. True beauty comes from a character of Christ within us. Not only that, there is today in 2018 more women and more teen girls who are depressed and anxious more than ever. Why? Because there has been a gap. The older generation is not standing there and speaking truth and love and grace. There's been a gap. And they're standing on their own and they're getting beat up and they feel like failures. Yes, Men need to do their part. Husbands need to do their part. We need to encourage, but we cannot speak to the generation of younger women in the way that the older women can. We can't. We can't do it. We mess it up, right, guys? Every time we try to be that voice. Now, we should speak encouragement. We should speak truth and love. We should build them up. But it can't just be us. It has to be the older women. And the older women, it is Desperate times, you are needed. You are needed. I'm going to share another statistic that I heard recently that just blew me away. Among Christian women, Christian women are just as likely as Christian men to step out of their marriages in 2018. If you go 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, that wasn't the case. Stupid guys were the ones that were being unfaithful, and that was the majority. Now, women are just as likely to be unfaithful in their marriage. Why? Because they are left to slaughter. Because the church, the church has said, they don't want what I have. They don't, they don't listen to me. Don't give up. I'm telling you, the enemy has targeted Christian women, young girls, young women. He's targeting them, and they're being separated, and they are being completely, completely attacked by the enemy. And it's got to change, church. It's got to change. And it breaks my heart because I see it all the time. And so what's the message? What does God want to speak to you today? If you are an older woman, and you know what I mean by that, and you're in the season of life, it's time to seek the Lord to do the work in your life so that you can seek the Lord to who God would have you come alongside. And if you are a younger woman or you're a teen girl, I want to say to you, you are loved, you are precious, you are a daughter of the king, and you need older women to be able to help you. Because the world is full of lies. And the world is telling you nothing but just deceitful, evil things just to pull you away from who you are in Christ. I, 
I, I, I pray this message. I mean, I know there's just a, a group here, but I, I pray the church starts to listen and that you all spread this truth out. We need each other. Would you say that with me? We need each other. Say that again. We need each other. It's about unity. It's about the power of Christ working within us. We need each other. We need the power of Christ working among every generation. And we need to kick the enemy out. We need to kick him out. Because he has no power over us. Do you know that? That's why James says, resist him and he'll do what? Flee. He has no power over Jesus Christ. He has no authority over those who belong to Christ except what we give him. But we have stepped back and said, younger girls, young women, young moms, yeah, you, you're on your own. We got to stop it. We got to stop it. Lee, would you pray? Because I, I need you to pray, brother. Just, just pray over the congregation. Just pray, please. God, Father, as we... we... Daryl has given us such a, a challenge from your word. And, and God, it is so true that uh, if you would look to your left and look to your right and understand those people are vital. Everyone here, Father, our family is so vital. God, I pray that you be with us as we, uh, we, we bridge this gap that is being created. Father, we don't want to fall into the same trap that we've seen over and over throughout Scripture as Satan has divided and created division between, between generations. And as a result, Father, we end up with a generation that do not know you. God, Father, I do pray that, uh, that we, we reach out, the older generation reach towards the younger and the younger towards the older and, and we value each other and we see, Father, you have a plan for each of us, God. Each of us has a reason we're here. Each of us you have specific plans for. And we cannot do that just by sitting on the bench, Father. We cannot do that by sitting in the pew. Father, we have to act Father, we have to hear your word, and then we have to go and be the church. God, may we reach out to those around us and bridge this gap. Father, bless this church. Watch over, protect us, God. It's your son's precious name, I pray.